In this last lesson of the Redshift Cinema 4D video course, we're going to see some final effects that we can use in our final renderings. We learned how to set up our uh, exterior renderings, interior renderings, orbital rendering. Now we're going to conclude with some of the extra tools that, that we can use. Now we saw other extra features and extra tools in the various previous lessons about the outdoor uh, rendering or indoor. We talked about the environment and how to give a lot of different atmosphere to our scene and um, use uh, uh, effects or exposure. And so we went through like the three main possibilities, I think. So a single object render, a, an indoor and an outdoor. And uh, we conclude uh, with this video showing a little bit more about the animation part and the post-production and again some like final touches that we can give to our, to our scene. So this is the previous scene where we set up this um, environment with the RS environment tool and um, also we set up a little bit of like bloom and um, lens effects and um, I want to show you here that if I start to here turn off the environment right away, so you can see how, how much does the environment in this exterior rendering. So this this looks okay, but uh, you know it, it needs a lot of fixing. So environment sometimes can also replace the the background and uh, the, the dome light or the, the HDRI, it actually emits light in a way. So I'm continuing to turn off here the, the other lights just to show you that we can work in a combination of natural light and artificial lights. And then once we set up the lighting, we go to the camera and set up the exposure as we saw. So we have, we saw, we saw the aperture of the shutter, but also if you want to do some animation, you can use the, the motion blur, which is also manageable and uh, customizable. And you know you can access the parameters here together. So you can act the you can have the default used due to the depth of field, and you can have also the the focus of the the motion blur. So. Also the bokeh effect, you can add, if you want, customized parameters, or you can add an image. Also for the distortion of the length, you, you can add a specific image. So if you want to be really specific with this and simulate cameras, again, just look for in, in Google some information. So you can see that the, the shutter also affects the motion blur, which is an effect we're going to see at the end of the video. But we already work with the shutter simulating the depth of field or DOF and lens distortion. So you can see that, you know, lenses have, each lens has applied some sort of distortion. If you want, you can search for the lens distortion map and just drag it and drop it in that slot in the camera if you want that additional effect. And this is the bokeh effect. So there are like diff so many different types of bokeh. If you want something specific, you can just click and drag the image on to the empty folder slot that, that we just saw. So sometimes are like hexagons and they are octagon and uh, you know they have different shapes. Now another pretty cool effect that you can simulate are acoustics. Now acoustics um, it's also pretty heavy to simulate in render engine so I personally usually don't, don't do that so often so you can you know, just fake some caustics. I'm going to show you how to do that. Or you can just simulate them and see what happens. And I'm going to... Well, we, we worked with this float, floating tiny home in the previous lesson. So if you want to get this model, there it is. And by the way, we are all, um, now going in another scenario. So we leave the outdoor exterior scenario. So if you want to do also exterior rendering animation, I suggest three motion and also Enscape and uh, other software like Vantage that they are good for setting up like ex really big exterior scene. Now for this scene I'm going to use the ring that we already used in another lesson from Turbo Squid and I've already created a scene here with the ring 
in the center and then I got a studio backdrop from the library so pretty easy and quick scene so we can test some of the advanced effects just like I did in another lesson when you want to test things that are a little bit heavy just create a small scene now I'm gonna start with a spotlight I added a spotlight I want to point this spotlight uh, toward the the ring so we can just focus on that part we don't really need to set up a, a, a complex lining in here we just want to test some effects using just one spotlight so that's gonna be easy and to see and quick we can see in the render uh, in the rendering in the viewport so remember you can you, you can always start with the interactive progressive rendering then you can go to bucket mode and then you can go to the final render once everything is set up well bucket mode is pretty close to the final render anyway now I want to project here a uh, some branches because I want to simulate something I want to simulate a tree that is not actually there so this is something you usually do in post-production you can like do photo montages of trees you can you can create more layers you can use Photoshop I usually use Pixar which is free open and um, it's online so I don't need to download and install anything and I have this Express version which is really fast so I can open up here any image so let me open the tree image just to show you that I'm gonna do uh, fixing here so I'm using this to fix this image but you can use it to fix any image you can use it to do post-production and you find also video courses about Pixar and also Photoshop and GIMP in the channel so this is just gonna be quick I'm just gonna add a new layer here a white layer on the background so that is not transparent or black because I wanna have I wanna use this kind of a like an alpha channel or like you know to project some shadows so if you wanna project shadows of objects that are not actually there in your scene you can simulate them so you can I can simulate uh, these trees just by clicking and drag dropping this into the spotlight um, image projection which we already discovered previously but you know that's to show you an additional thing you can do you can simulate and that's kind of a small image in there so you maybe want to scale the the size or you just can push away the the spotlight a little bit but you know it's a uh, it's like simulating a circular window with some trees on the outside that are projecting light so sometimes you don't need to do something you, you can just simulate it and you can simulate this even again better in Photoshop so usually with post-production I go in other software but we do we can do some tricks in here and that's this is this is one of the the tricks I will put here none in the DK so I will not have like limits to the how, how far I can go with this projection just gonna adjust the intensity the exposure as we already know and we see the effect now that it's being projected and that's the ring right there so if I go really close to the ring and I don't see what's around it, it will look like there is a tree in there but, but th there is no actual tree so that's one thing you can do now if I add um, redshift environment you can um, mix the the environment effect with here the scattering the attenuation which is also called again volumetric light or volume light or you know volume effect it's called in many ways but I can do I can work with both with the image projection and with the environment to have this actual light cone of light or like light streaks they are also called God rays now I've changed here from um, the decay so be careful the decay will change the effect of your light so you, you may need to adjust it and we'll also check that your cone will hit the ground otherwise it's, it's not going to be visible so that's another interesting effect I guess you can do in interiors exteriors and um, also with single objects just gonna adjust a little bit the the scattering here and the attenuation and there is also another Possibility. Now let me change here. I change with the with an image, so I have a colored projector instead of having a black and white projector. That's also something you can do. It's kind of a you know cool effect that you can do in so many ways that 
you can also like try yourself. Again, I will adjust the scattering. I'll drop down the scattering. I increase the attenuation. And let's get here in a closer look. So you can see the, the ring in there. And now in the spotlight, if you go in the details panel where we can set up the shadows and the transparency and also the we will talk about AOVs in this video but if I go down here you see we have contribution now in the various types of contribution you also have well we, we discover some of these previously like reflection refraction so how this light contributes to these different effects in the scene and you also have volume so you can see that this is another way you can manage the intensity of the volumetric light or volumetric effects or volume effects in your scene and then here you have caustics as well so you you, you want to turn that on if you want to use caustics now this is an example of caustics like the the ones that water generates at the bottom of a pool that's you know something again you can just simulate by projecting here an image with caustics you can also project an animation by the way not only a single and static image as we discover Previously, you can project an animation and, again, work not with static images but with animations. Now, I'm going to add also dome light because this is pretty dark. And look what happens if I make this dome light like a little bit bluish and a little bit darker. Well, it simulates like an underwater scene. So that's, you know, we're not actually creating the, the whole under uh, water world just with a couple of effects here with the environment with the dome light with the spotlight with the projection of um, caustic effects there you go we have this sort of effect so my uh, suggestion is don't always go for the you know heavier thing which is simulating or calculating sometimes you can just do post-production in Photoshop if you want to do static images or uh, post-production in uh, After Effects if you want to do like animation. Now I've added here a new material which is called the RS Noise material in the utilities of Redshift and that's another way you can manage the volumetric effects and I guess there are also others but this is just you know another one. So by changing the noise and you can see this the, the noise here goes directly in the volume output in this shader graph which means that it's going to affect the volumetric effects. So if I change here the, this noise, like all these parameters here, there are really a lot of them, but you, you can see the noise there in the scene. It's pretty bright. So maybe we can like turn this a little bit down in terms of intensity. But we, you see that there's kind of a noise, kind of a smoky effect again in that. And I can change here the type of noise in uh, fractal or turbulence and cell these are all different types of noise and uh, you can you can change the size of the noise so you just need to go there and play around as usual until you find something uh, interesting and I'm gonna change also the color here maybe I will do this uh, red so um, well actually here I need to change the color in in here because now we are managing the environment effect through this node so we cannot change it directly in the environment so you can see some red smoke like uh, fog in there or, or um, like kind of a red misty thing and also again if I have black and red it's, it's going darker and we can see a little bit of that effect now, uh, again, there are a lot of things you can play around here. You can invert the effect sometimes. But, um, well, that's, I think that's enough for, for environmental and volumetric. So I'm just going to turn off the environment. So right now I'm only seeing the cone of the, of the light. I'm going to decrease the intensity a little bit. And there you go. Now we are just working with the, with the spotlight and the ring. We don't have any material here for the ring, so if we want to do something like caustics, we need some uh, something that will have reflections and refractions. Now, usually caustics are created by refractive or transparent objects, so I'm going to apply a gold preset here on the base of the ring, and then for the gems, 
for the diamond, the little diamond, I'm gonna add something that looks like a ruby. So I wanna still stay in the red uh, color. Now it's really important which material you choose when you generate caustics. It's really important which object you choose because they will all act differently. So uh, it's not given that uh, that particular object will work fine or or that particular material. You can see this is a pretty simple object there. So I hope it works, but let's try. So um, I have applied here a standard material. I want to create one of my own and I want to do something transparent, of course. So I'm gonna here set this to red first and then I want, that's the, the diffuse and base color and then I want to set here the well reflection of, and refraction so in the reflection I think that's good we have like full reflection and IOR I want to do like 1.77 which is for Ruby and then in the refraction I want to increase the weight now you can make this perfectly transparent by increasing the weight all the way now, of course we need to increase the samples a little bit and also the dispersion will give you a nice you know like uh, glass like or um, transparent light effect you we don't want thin walled here because we want the entire object to be considered as solid we don't want like hollow objects so we don't want thin walled activated and i'm just gonna add a little bit of color here otherwise is it's gonna be like not how I intended this to be. I want this, there you go, nice and red. Now we can already see the transparent shadows projecting onto the floor and then we can try to generate a little bit more caustics in there. So that's kind of a, you know, simplified effect of the caustics, the, the transparent shadows. Now, uh, again, this is probably gonna be like too, not, not too complex object to use with caustics but anyway let's make sure that we have caustics on on the main light we're using in in my case i'm using the spotlight so the we have caustics in there and then we want to right click on the object that we use for caustics and apply a redshift object and in the visibility tab we have sorry visibility we we, we need to override and activate the cast caustics and also like receive and cast caustics and here in the redshift renderer we need to go to the advanced and we're gonna go in the caustics and this is only gonna work with the bucket mode and with the final rendering so here you can set up the photons so how many you wanna of course you, you, you need to like increase that a lot if you want a lot of quality from this but you can start to do some tests and see how, how it's going to go with your object and then increase and increase the quality and of everything like the, the global illumination, especially the samples for the refraction. So let's run a render here. If I run a, an interactive rendering, nothing will show up except the, the transparent shadows. Also want to create a region here. And so I'm going to go in the bucket mode. Bucket mode is going to take more time to show me something. So, you know, that's something I don't really like. I, I would like to see like the progressive rendering, something that I can see in real, in, in real time and then fix it. Not wait every time the bucket, but there you go. We have some caustics in there. They're not so extraordinary, but they're, they're all in there. So that's, you know to show you how it works, but then you need to go there and fix it. So maybe I will go in the global illumination. I uh, wanna use brute force because it's gonna be more accurate and increase here also in the in the trace depths, we can increase the overall or the refraction and the, the here in the samples of the material also, you may wanna increase the samples. And this is another material, it's called tinted glass. It's a preset from the from the standard legacy material. And there you go. Well, it doesn't create, it creates some strange uh, effects there, but it worked. So 
that's another effect you, you may want to consider, or you can just fake the caustics and again generate them in, uh, in a post production phase like in Photoshop or GIMP or Pixlr or Canva, you can just do a photo montage. Now there are other effects like the volume object tool but I'm just going to show you here in the manual. You, you'll find all the other, well, the, the, the last, the missing things that I didn't show in the course. You can find them in the manual. Now you can find also a scene right here of this demo volume effect. You can see it's kind of a like explosion. So this uh, type of file, the this file will just need to be opened in a, in a box like this and, and it's going to be visualized inside the render. And it's, uh, you know, something that you can create with other tools and then bring it in Redshift Render. So just to show you that we also have that volume tool. Now, um, we basically saw everything. We're just missing a few things that we're going to see now at the end of the video. But you, more or less, you know everything that you need to know about Redshift. And let me go back to the Redshift, and I want to use now the AOV, which is the possibility to do different passes, render separately different effects in images to work with them in compositing or post-production. Now you can define a folder for this. You can save this in a specific folder. You can uh, use a multipass EXR, which is an image that contains layers so you can work then with those layers again in other graphic design application and you can choose also to compress this if you want and uh, well the most important one is this one here the AOV manager so this is where you manage the AOV effects that you want to render so for example I can just click and drag here some of these like beauty is the most important one and it's already in there in the bucket rendering and in the final rendering and in the progressive rendering and then you have like ambient occlusion the the depth of field the global illumination the let me see here what we have refraction reflection so each basically each part of the of the image can be rendered apart and then you have also other things like object id which will render like different colors to do quick selection in photoshop and so on. So again, just to give you a demonstration, I put this in here and then that's all I need to do. So now if I render the, the image, this is again a really simple image just to show you. So if I render this in the render view, once the render is finished, you can see here I have the various passages. Now ambient occlusion here is pretty boring, so let's see something else. And also global illumination, uh, I think because I, I've used only one light, so there's no, nothing, in, no bounces and anything. But we can see some reflections, some shadows, some refraction. And I guess it's, it's still rendering here, so maybe I need to wait a little bit more if I want to have more of those uh, AOVs. But, you know, that's how it works. Once you finish, you can save all the images. You can save the multi-layer EXR in a folder. You can save... In PNG, you can save JPEG, wherever. Now, that's not the final render. Remember, the final render is the first button on the left next to the IPR button. So, I'm going to um, choose here a folder. You can also choose a saving folder. For example, if you're doing animation, you can use a specific folder and a specific file format like JPEG or PNG if you want alpha channel. You can save multi-pass image in, in PSD format like Photoshop. Everything you usually do in Cinema 4D, you can do it with Redshift or also other render engines like uh, Corona or B-Ray. Now these are other like uh, settings here. I want to show you another tool which is called the Bake Set and I think it's going to be the last. So the, the Bake Set here it's another utility, another feature that will let you bake the light and the shadows and everything on directly onto the object. So you can use it as a texture. And to do that, you just uh, need to select an object, which is this one, and go to the bake set. Click and drag that object inside that object's space inside the bake set parameters in there. 
and you just hit bake. Now baking is basically rendering, so you need to have the the, the some of these passes, but mostly you need to have the beauty pass at least to render these out. Um, but you also have like others, um, diffuse for example for the diffuse texture, but I think it the beauty will be enough. And here you can set up also the dimension, the size of the and the resolution of the texture you're gonna bake. And that's pretty much it. So now you just need to bake and select the selected objects in this case. Or well we don't want to bake all the, the whole scene, but you can also do it. Otherwise, selected objects, current frame, because we're not doing an animation. The AOV, you can see the the, the the full beauty, and that's it. Just bake. And if nothing happens, uh, probably it's because this object doesn't have a UV. Yeah, it's, it's seeing here that it's skipping this render, rendering here of the bake set, because this object doesn't have UVs, which means it doesn't have a mapping. We already talked about mapping, unwrapping, and all that stuff. Well, you need to have an unwrapped map because each part of the object needs to be unique and needs to be, you know, uh, used as to bake that that single uh, specific part. Now, these other scene we used before. This one at the UV. So I'm using this one here. Just the same exact process. Create a bake set. Drop in the the object, and also. Uh, drop in, in the UV source, you can drop in the object bake, and now it's baking. So you just need to wait a little bit until it's finished. S remember to specify a folder where you save it, and this is it. This is the texture that I've just baked with the, with all that red lining. That's, that's the original one. It was like black and white, and this is, I'm going to show you here. Now this one, it's still the original object with the original texture. So if I render these out, start to, you know, take off some of these red lights in the scene. Now everything should appear white. There you go. So you can see it's blank and white. So now if I apply the baked texture that I have just baked with the bake set onto this object, I'm going to see the difference. So that's the object right here. I'm going to drop down the, the texture in the material node, drop it inside the color node and that's it. Now we can see that this texture here does have some red color coming from not the actual environment here but coming from the baked texture that we just baked. So it baked the shadows, the, the fuse effects, the, uh, the, the lights and etc etc. Now let's finish with animation. Again if you know Cinema 4D you know how to do animation. I'm just gonna do something quick here. I'm just gonna record this movement of the car from a point to another. If you don't know how to use Cinema 4D, you'll see an entire video course dedicated to Cinema 4D in the channel and it will explain how basically you can animate anything in Cinema 4D. You can animate materials, you can create, you can use videos for materials, you can animate lights, you can animate objects, you can animate effects, so many things. Cinema 4D is ex uh, extraordinary when you when it comes to you know motion graphics, 3D motion graphics, etc. Now that I have the movement of the car, I can go back to the camera settings and play a little bit with the motion blur. Now something I messed up here is the and I want to talk about that. So well, first of all, we don't need camera motion because we are not moving the camera, so you can deactivate that unless you're you're animating the camera and not the object and motion blur we can override here or we can use the render settings so render settings are right here again in the advanced section we have a panel dedicated to motion blur this is the one right here so you can enable it right here and again you can use this or you can override with the camera and we have so so many settings here now don't mess up the offset that's my suggestion. So let's override here and you can change the shutter. Well, let's first run a render for the exposure because this motion blur effect will need to pass through the camera. And when we use the camera with the filmic camera, well, we need to change the shutter speed. 
and by changing the shutter speed we will change the exposure I also want to change the, the, the environment here when I use uh, an outdoor instead of this uh, well this is also an outdoor but I have more I want more space around the car so that it looks that it's actually moving in this outdoor space I'm just gonna replace the previous HDR and I'm gonna rotate it here and I think that's fine so uh, once I fix that let's run a an EPR and there you go so this is now static it doesn't move so well it actually it is moving because I animated the car but it's in the it, it looks like static because we don't have any motion blur now if I start to play around with the shutter time in there so you can see if I decrease this value I'm gonna have more light which means that uh, I'm gonna have a slower shutter and if I increase the value I'm gonna have dark darkness which means I'm gonna have quicker uh, shutter speed so to have the motion blur we need to have brighter scenes and a slower shutter speed so lower number in the shutter time in there and well if nothing happens it's because we need to do back rendering or final rendering to see the, the actual effect so I'm gonna open up the render viewer and now it, let me show you here let's do a final render this time so I never use this actually but that's the final render button in there that I mentioned before and that's to have like the, the really you know final maximum render if you set up that in the render settings now the car it appears like it, it's not in the position where it's supposed to you can see I'm, I am at the 29 frames so you kind of in the middle of the movement animation so uh, it should appear in the middle but it doesn't this is because I accidentally used the offset and that's causing this thing so I can see the car in there I cannot see the effect yet so let me go here in the output also it, this is where you can export one current frame or the entire frame range of the animation all the frames wherever so we explain this in the cinema 4d course now to if I want to make sure I want that exact frame I only have one I only want one frame I'm gonna use the I'm gonna type it so I'm gonna type 29 29 so I, I make sure that I only have one frame and there you go we can see something there and the offset that's the one that if you accidentally change it it's gonna change basically the time so you can see where my car is at the moment so let's put the offset down let's also this is kind of an extreme motion blur so I wanna decrease the the the, the effect now let me move this current time indicator in the timeline forward so we can see the car in the middle and again be careful on the shutter offset you can see that it's still not good because the car is too much on the right so let's put zero and now it's, it should appear exactly in the in the middle so if you want remember less motion blur you need to increase this time the shutter time which means it's going to increase the speed of the of the shutter so it's gonna capture better the movement and of course we see darker here so we need to balance with the shutter aperture or with the ISO or with the exposure so one way or the other we need to balance everything until we find the perfect balance as I think I have found or maybe I can just a little bit less of, of motion blur but you know this is how it works we need to figure out uh, all the different um, elements here and also we can apply post-production effects directly in the render viewer or you can just save the image and continue in Photoshop now we do have here a lot of things like you can adjust also the exposure here some of these don't, don't need to be re-rendered so you can just come in here you can do some color correction with the white balance so maybe if I want this more reddish I can use the the color the white point to like a more blue and then you have vignetting aperture you can adjust the aperture the shutter here but that's not gonna affect the the actual 
uh, motion blur. It's just gonna affect the exposure. And then you you also like bokeh again if you want and apply more effects like the the lens, the bloom. All that stuff can be added in post production directly in Redshift if you want. Otherwise, you can just do it again in other graphic design software. And then you also have like color correction here. You have curves. You have uh, you know a lot of others hidden here. Just check on the the effect that you want to add and just go in there and adjust it until you are satisfied. And that's it. So we just explore everything we need to know about Redshift. Now it's just a matter of working in there, experiment, become really good at it, and that's it. Only with experiments you will do it. So thanks for watching this video course. If you enjoyed, please subscribe to the channel. If you want to support us, join the channel as a supporter. Check our other courses that we have already published and um, uh, see everything that if you're looking for something specific, just search it in the in the channel with the search bar and uh, that's it. So thanks again and see you in the next video course and good luck.